And if I told you once, I ain't going to tell you twice or three times or four or five or six or seven or 168 like we're up to now. Salute all my real ones. Yeah, look, bro, we got how does a quantum computer work? There was a dude on uh, the Joe Rogan podcast breaking down quantum physics and quantum computers. And I'm just like this. So, yeah, I really want to see this video. I hope y'all want to see this with me because apparently this is supposed to be the future of computing, even though, like, quantum computers are supposed to be mad fragile and they, like, need mad cooling or whatever. So, we about to get into that. But before we do that, like button, subscribe button, notification bell, press those. Let's go! A classical computer performs operations using classical bits, which can be either zero or one. Right. Now, in contrast, a quantum computer uses quantum bits or... Now you lost me. ...or qubits, and they can be both zero and one at the same time. Now you really lost me. And it is this that gives a quantum computer its superior computing power. There are a number of physical objects that can be used as a qubit. A single photon, a nucleus, or an electron. I met up with researchers who are using the outermost electron in phosphorus as a qubit. Okay. But how does that work? Well, all electrons have magnetic fields, so they're basically like tiny bar magnets. Bing. And this property is called spin. If you place them in a magnetic field, they will align with that field, just like a compass needle lines up with the magnetic field of the Earth. Now this is the lowest energy state, so you could call it the zero state, or we call it for the electron, spin down. <laughs> now you can put it in a one state or spin up, but that takes some energy. If you took out the glass from your compass, you could turn the needle the other way, but you would have to apply some force to it. You have to push it to flip to the other side. And that is the highest energy state. In principle, if you were so delicate to really put it exactly against the magnetic field, it would stay there. Now, so far, this is basically just like a classical bit. It's got two. Now you really lost me. Two states spin up and spin down, which are like the classical one and zero. But the funny thing about quantum objects is that they can be in both states at once. Right, now, when you measure direction. the spin, it will be either up or down. But before you measure it, the electron can exist in what's called a quantum superposition, where these coefficients indicate the relative probability of finding the electron in one state or the other. Now, it's hard to imagine how this enables the incredible computing power of quantum computers. Comment section, translate for me. What the? Frack. What? Huh? I, I still can't, can't get past the... Um, the other guy was talking about a, 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 a quantum particle can spin in both directions at the same time. If that makes sense to you, please, by all means, break it down to, to the doofuses that... Well, the one doofus that's in front of the camera. Without considering two interacting quantum bits. Hello. Hi. Now there are four possible states of these two electrons. You could think that, well, that's just like two bits of a classical computer, right? If you have two bits, you can write 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? There's four numbers. But these are still just two bits of information. Right? All I need to say to determine which one of the four numbers you have in your computer code is the value of the first bit and the value of the second bit. Right? Here instead, quantum mechanics allows me to make superposition of each one of these four states. So I can write a quantum mechanical state which is perfectly legitimate, that is some coefficient times this, plus some coefficient times that, plus some coefficient times that, plus some coefficient. So to determine the state of this two-spin system, I need to give you four numbers, four coefficients. Whereas in the classical example of the two bits, I only need to give you two bits. 
So this is how you understand why two qubits actually contain four bits of information. I need to give you four numbers to tell you the state of this system. Whereas here I only need two. Now if we make three spins, we would have eight different states. I need to give you eight different numbers to define the state of those three spins. Whereas classically it's just three bits. If you keep going, what you'll find is that the amount of equivalent classical information contained by n qubits is 2 to the power n classical bits. And of course, the power of exponentials... Yo, yeah. and this dude over here making that face like, oh, simple, right? No, no! Look, is look at 2 to the power n classical bits. Yo, you making that face like this is all simple, like, nah, bro, nah. I'm still lost, but I'm just gonna shut the fuck up now. And of course, the power of exponentials tells you that once you have, let's say, 300. Bro, I went to public school in Harlem, bro. Like, take it easy on me. Of those qubits in what we call the fully entangled state. So you must be able to. What does. Algis Alcina, Jada Pinkett, and Will Smith got to do with quantum... Create these really crazy states where there is a superposition of all three unders being one way and another way and another way and so on. Then you have like 2 to the 300 classical bits, which is as many particles as there are in the universe. But there's a catch. Although the qubits can exist in any combination of states, when they are measured, they must fall into one of the basis states. And all the other information about the state before the measurement is lost. So you don't want, generally, to have as the final result of your quantum computation something that is a very complicated superposition of states. Because you cannot measure a superposition. You can only measure one of these basis states. Right? Like down, down, up, up. Yeah. So what you want is to um, design the logic operations that you need to get to the final computational result in such a way that the final result is something you're able to measure. It's just a unique state, essentially. That's not trivial, is it? That's not trivial. And it's essentially, I'm kind of stretching things here, but I guess it's to some degree the reason why quantum computers are not a replacement for classical computers. They're not? Quantum no, they're not. They're not universally faster. They're only faster for special types of calculations where you can use the fact that you have all these quantum superpositions available to you at the same time to do some kind of computational parallelism. If you just want to watch a video in high, in high definition or browse the internet or, or write some documenting word, they're not going to give you any particular uh, improvement if you need to use a classical algorithm to get to the result. So you should not think of a quantum computer as something where every operation is faster. In fact, every operation is probably going to be slower than in the computer you have on the desk. But it's an, a, a computer where the number of operations required to arrive at the result is exponentially small. Okay. So the No, not okay. No. No, no, no! Improvement is not. So what you, all I'm hearing is, oh, this computer is better, and I don't got a tan on my hairline, and Apple's never gonna make a quantum MacBook Pro. That, that's literally. So you went through all this bullshit, made me break my brain, like I literally lost like two and a half years of my life just now, cause. I literally tried to computate what the hell he's talking about. And then at the end of it, you're like, oh, but you could just use a regular calculator just instead. Or if you have a Chromebook, you could just use that. Or if you got a typewriter, you could just use that. In the speed of the individual operation. One of these days, the Total Alice. number of operations you need. I don't support domestic violence. To arrive at the result. But that is only the case in particular types of calculations, in particular algorithms. It's not universally the case. Which is why it's not a replacement of a classical. 
Well, I feel dumb. How about you? Comment section. Just let me know. Come on. Hit me with the slander. Let me know what y'all thought of the video. Uh, he explained it. All right, let me stop joking around. He explained it. Um, I already knew about the whole superposition parts, and I knew about the down, down, up, up, um, and how you need to explain it. But it's still like, like I guess what I, I really don't get is um, a, a quantum particle can be can uh, be in two positions at once if you're not looking at it, but once you look at it, it actually is only spinning in one direction. And it could be either or, and then he's talking about, you can try to calculate the percentage of it spinning up, down, left, right, whatever, horizontal, whatever the hell uh, way it's going. I get all that, but how the hell do you make, how do you grab a quantum particle and put it in a computer? Is what I guess what I don't understand. That's just me. Doofus from Harlem speaking, man, I'm going to leave it like that. My name is Rain. Catch you on the flip side. RCP. Salute. Wait for it. That bonus.